Hi, everybody. We're back. Live in Las Vegas, this is Dave Vellante from Wikibon.org. We are covering a number of events today. The HP Gen 8 announcement. We got our man Jeff Kelly's at the Data Warehouse Institute. Uh, Stu Miniman's been uh, hanging out with some of the guys from the VMware Partner Conference. A lot of action in Vegas this week, and we're with, here with uh, Richard Fischera, who is Vice President and Senior Research Analyst at Forrester. Uh, Richard spends a lot of his time uh, looking at converged infrastructure and, and data center issues, but also, Richard, you spend a lot of time with customers as well. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. This is uh, always a treat. Yeah, good to have you. Um, well, let's see. Let's just get right into it. I mean, Gen 8, HP's talking about you know, the importance of automation. Um, in your assessment, have they hit the mark? Yeah, this one is, this one is pretty spectacular. I mean, I, when I first uh, started hearing about Gen 8, I was expecting the usual, you know, we got, we got the next generation Intel processors, we got, you know, maybe we've made some enhancements to the faster. system board. Yeah, fast, <laughs> faster, probably more power efficient, maybe we've got some better hardware management and fast stuff. But this is really, this is like a whole, this is like a wide frontal assault on all the things that I've been hearing for a decade as as significant cost and operational pressure pressures on the data center operators. So, do you have this force to have a scenario around so-called next generation servers, and and does this fit into that mold? Uh, we don't have a formal scenario document, mm -hmm. but yeah, this definitely fits into you know fits into what an intelligent vendor would be doing. Because Let's come the, up with one right here, real time. Well, the, well, <laughs> the scenario is, you, you know, I think they approached it the right way, and I have to sort of issue the the, dis, the disclosure. I was, I was uh, for four years, I was director of Blade System Strategy at HP, so I know this from the inside. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, you got to listen to your customers, and what I'm seeing today is, are things that we were hearing, uh, you know, when I was there from 2006 to 2010, and as an analyst, I've been hearing for a decade from customers of every vendor. So the pressures, uh, the pressures on cost uh, operation, particularly OpEx, as CapEx has become less of an issue, the pressures on OpEx and power efficiency have become extreme. So what they've done is they've answered the, they've answered the, the requirements their customers are putting on them, and that's kind of the that's kind of the core of what a smart long-term server strategy is. You better answer your customers' problems, or you're not going to do so well. And what they have done is applied some very appropriate technology solutions and wrapped it up with some services that's going to be very hard for other people to duplicate. Yeah, so they're really following the money on this one. To your point, it's not in the CapEx, it's in the OpEx, and that's really where this is aimed. But you made a point in the panel that I thought was right on, and I want to talk about, have you talk about it a little bit, which is the messaging that we're hearing is a, there's a lot in there on unplanned downtime, and sure, a, a, a catastrophic event is going to be expensive, but your point was that planned downtime is actually, on an ongoing basis, a lot more expensive. That's where most people are spending their money. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's not as visible because it's not catastrophic. It's mm. built into the budget, it's built into the schedule, and the way you build it in is by having more resources and spending your, spending your precious OPEX dollars on managing downtime and maintenance and configuration changes in a non-disruptive way. And that's, that's not cheap and it's not easy. So it's kind of hid, it's a hidden problem because it doesn't result in the company's sales, sales portal going down or, or, you know, or calls at two in the morning. But it's a huge budget item and, and a big operational issue. And it's those things in combination that suck away the resources from being able, for example, to implement a new project for a brand new business requirement. So Richard, what are your clients telling you in terms of how they want to drive change in the, in the data center? Well, most of my clients would be very happy to be in a position to actually drive change instead of reacting to mm -hmm. external pressures. Just to be in the position to drive the change on a planned, proactive way is a, is, is a step forward for a lot of organizations. Um, they typically want to try, you know, their, in their hearts, they want to try and stay ahead of the business requirements, but usually it's, mm -hmm. it's like the old thing about when you're up to your ass in alligators, you hard to remember you came there to drain the swamp, you know? <laughs> so, um, the other thing I want to talk about is the, the energy piece. Uh, obviously, there's a, a lot of the uh, thrust of this announcement is aimed at, at the energy. Um, having said that, a lot of CIOs, and I think actually, I think Forrester had some data a couple years ago that I saw that about 
And I know the number's been ticking up, so maybe you can update it, but I think at the time, maybe 15% of the CIOs out there actually saw the power budget. Has that changed? Um, it's, uh, we've, I have not seen a, a good hard number on it. I think the number has gone up because I hear more of them are more aware of it. So I, I'd, be, I'd be comfortable in saying that even if they don't get the bill in their budget, they're much more aware of it than they used to be. But there's still some structural problems in a lot of organizations. There's still a lot of companies where the person that pays the power bill doesn't have a direct connection to the IT operations. You know, the facilities has always been sort of a separate walled-off domain. Uh, so it's probably fair to say the situation's getting better, but it's certainly not perfect yet. So as a, as a person who follows data centers quite closely, um, you'll appreciate this quote. A CIO said to me the other day, last month, and he was in New York at an event, and he said to me, my budget's not growing at 45% a year, but my data is. And um, I think it underscores the situation in a lot of data centers. On the other hand, you've got these cloud service providers that are growing like crazy, and their budgets are growing like crazy. What do you see as the juxtaposition between the cloud service provider and the traditional data center? Are the, is the traditional data center manager under pressure to perform like a cloud service provider? Absolutely. And the, uh, the good news, bad news, good news is, bad news is he is under that pressure to perform like a cloud provider. The good news is that I think there's going to be definitely sort of a merging of the DNA over the next several years as companies like HP bring to the enterprise IT people some of the capabilities that the cloud providers have in terms of the, some of the economics. Uh, but absolutely, the, the, uh, you know, the, the yardstick against which they're compared now is more and more the cloud provider. Um, but I think a lot of that technology is going to be available to them. The ability to, the ability to rapidly deploy servers, for example, that's a thing that a cloud provider has to do really well. But now you see with the Gen 8, there are opportunities for the, uh, the enterprise IT people to get very efficient deployment of their, of their servers. Uh, the monitor, the operational monitoring and so on, uh, you know, those are becoming more and more accessible. Um, but the pressure will remain. Um, and in terms of overall demand for servers, which is a little off your topic, but whether the application lives in a cloud or in your data center, it's still got to live somewhere and execute. So cloud is not going to reduce the demand for servers. If anything, it's going to increase it. Yeah, I know, I would agree. That's an interesting topic and one that, you know, I used to work, be a number cruncher at IDC, and, and I <clears throat> always noticed when prices dropped, demand went up. You know, it was an elastic market, and yeah. I would think, if anything, it's going to increase it. Um, but I want to follow up on, on the, the cloud service question is, what do you tell your customers, or what are you seeing in your client base around chargebacks? Because they have to act like these cloud mm -hmm. service providers, but only maybe 20% of them at most do chargebacks. Do they have to start doing that? Uh, the answer in a classical consultant fashion is it depends. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends. In an ideal world, we like to say, you know, the definition of cloud includes, you know, elasticity, always on, fine grain chargeback. Now, my colleague James Staten and I go around and around on this, and you know, in, in various fashions, but I don't think that perfect chargeback is always a requirement in a corporation as long as the economics of the sol of the solution are reflected somewhere realistically in the budget it doesn't have to be a perfect chargeback it can be an allocation it can be a fixed fee as long as in the end it's a realistic reflection of the resources it doesn't have to be a perfect per cpu minute chargeback uh, however you're right most people don't do it it's a challenge and designing the right kind of the designing the right kind of chargeback is a challenge, but I, I'm not. A, uh, if we were a lawyer, we would we would be saying strict constructionalist, you know, or con, you know, I'm I'm not a strict constructionalist on chargeback. I think as long as it makes business sense, and it makes the resource consumption visible to the man, to the financial management system. It doesn't have to be a perfect chargeback system. Yeah, so a cloud service provider has to obviously run IT like a business because their IT is a business. Yes. So you're saying an internal data center manager has to be business-like yes. and very efficient like a cloud service provider, but doesn't necessarily have to have all the metrics in place and all the systems in place to, to thrive. A exactly, because l remember, the chargeback itself and the process of administering it costs money. And it's always, this has always been, historically, there's always been this balance between fine-grained metrics and what it costs to implement the fine-grained metrics. And, you know, and this has been a, 
this has been a juggling act since practically since the first day I got a paycheck in the computer industry. Right. That fundamental problem hasn't changed. If you make the if you make the metrics sufficiently granular and sufficiently uh, granular and fine intervals uh, and a very tight financial control system. You can end up spending more money on the fine grain metrics than they will save you in, in internal costs. Yeah, and could end up getting shot by people in your organization, yeah, right. too. Um, all right, um, my last question is uh, on, on a couple of dimensions. Um, on a scale of 1 to 10, how relevant uh, do you see this announcement? Oh, I'd say about uh, 9.321. 9.3, 3, so pretty relevant. Yes, yeah, very, seriously, on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, 9, you know, because nobody wants to give it a 10, and anything less is probably less than it should get. This, yeah. is, this is a very significant it's a announcement. Deal. It's a big deal because of the, the breadth of integrate, the breadth, the, the number of places they've touched the fundamental problem of data center operating expenses is, is what really impresses me. Each point technology in its own is interesting. There are cases, you know, other people have some technologies and products that address some of these points, but there's nothing I've seen that addresses the whole breadth of them the way they did. And I really think they did do this from a very user-centric uh, perspective. So, yeah, the, uh, the scientific analysis in, in the end is this is a big deal. Yeah, good. All right, Richard. Well, thanks very much for coming inside the cube and sharing your perspectives. You you, you bring a great independent view. Forrester's continues to do a good job. So uh, thank you very much for the great work that you're doing in the in the community. And uh, we'd love to have you back sometime. Well, thank you. It's uh, it's an honor in the uh, analyst uh, fraternity to be in the cube. Oh well, you know? as I say, you're welcome back anytime, thank my you. friend. All right, take care. All right, everybody. Um, we are going to be right back after a quick reset. Uh, this is Dave Vellante. We're live from Las Vegas, HP's Gen, Gen 8 announcement. And uh, keep it right.